For almost as long as there's been television in Nebraska, Backyard Farmer has been on the air. First locally around Lincoln and then across the state, our favorite gardening program has changed very little since that first show in 1953. We've made it to 60 seasons for the simple reason that we love gardening. We want to share that passion with our audience. Let's take a minute to look back, hear from some old friends, tell a few stories, and have a whole lot of fun. Backyard Farmer, 60 seasons and still growing. Television was the new and exciting technology sweeping the country in the 1950s. Nebraska's first television station came on the air in 1949 in Omaha. Four years later, right here in Lincoln, KFOR TV was up and running, and along with it, the first broadcast of Backyard Farmer. Backyard Farmer was created by two broadcasting giants of Nebraska. George Brown, Director of University Relations, and Jack McBride, a public television pioneer at Nebraska ETV. Backyard Farmer was produced from KOLN TV's studios until we were able to construct our first KUON TV studio in the basement of the Temple Building mm -hmm. here on uh, the downtown campus. And the fascinating thing about it is because it provided with regularity such practical, useful information in an entertaining manner, covering any and all subjects of lawn and, and garden, that it continues with that same basic format to this day. Backyard Farmer had already been on the air. That had been the brainchild of George Round. George Round played a very important part in the history of uh, early educational television in Nebraska. And I think one of the strengths of the show has always been the contrast in those personalities, too. You know, George, uh, George had a rough, uh, not a roughness, but a, a rough hewnness about his personality. He, he could be very short with people. <laughs> and he, he didn't suffer fools lightly, you know. He did that show and he did another one called Your Unicameral. And his demeanor really fit your unicamera better than it fit Backyard Farmer, I always felt. And tonight we're celebrating the Backyard Farmer's 20th year on television and the dedication of the new Nebraska Telecommunications Center. Our colleagues from the Agricultural Extension Service at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln will be around for the next uninterrupted 90 minutes to visit with you about backyard farming. George Round was an institution in and of himself. He was a man that was highly respected. And you have to remember, of course, he was the director of university relations. And so he obviously knew what a program like this would mean to the image of the university. And George loved to do the program. All of those guys on the panel uh, were, were really good professionals, knew their craft, but uh, they'd never been in front of a TV camera. And, and George at least made them at home and, and helped bring them into the, into the show. So George put them at ease and helped orchestrate the whole thing. One of the major stars of our early backyard farmer was Wayne Whitney, a real favorite of all of ours. He'd get in his car and drive 80 miles out into the state because somebody had called in and said, would you come and take a look at our tree? This tree and I've been in our family for 50 years. Help us out here. He would do that. But Wayne had this wonderful sense of humor. He wasn't, he, Wayne was one of the people that was a true natural for public, for television. He was always himself. He never covered himself in any secure blanket of I'm going to be very formal and make no mistakes here. He said what he thought. John, you sure that's not a leaf spot? Uh, no, it doesn't have an organism associated with it. You know organism? Mm -mm. 
Well, there's a lot of things that aren't organized. Yeah, well, <laughs> that, that is, it's, not, it's a leaf spot, true, well, it's true, but, I mean, it's not caused by a fungus. Well, then this yeah. is a physiological yeah. thing, and it could be very well from overwatering. Yes. This buckthorn. How about saying a little bit about size and... Well, they get up there pretty good size. I've, I've seen those things up around 15, 20 feet. They use them some for hedging. They do have a purple berry on them at the axle of the leaves, and the botanical name is Ramnus cathartica, and it means that. <laughs> and what those, those berries and a bird can do to white cars out of this world. <laughs> Wayne, thank you very much. The same lady. Do you want any more? That's enough. <laughs> How fresh can manure be before you use it in your garden? And without a smile, my dear friend Wayne Whitney answered, before I use manure, I always hope that it has taken at least one bounce. He didn't crack a smile. I started to ask the next question, and of course he would wink at me at that point. Here's a lady called in, and she has aphids on her asters. And then he'd turn to the panelists. What do you do about a lady's aphids on her asters? He was the one that wrote on the board the answers while we uh, verbalized them, what he would write on the, on the board. And lots of times I remember Wayne would write the answer on before I could give it. <laughs> so as a young, you know, a young squirt that didn't know a whole lot why, I appreciated that. Wayne was a neat guy. Somebody called the show and said, a lot of trees have separate sexes. Some have males and some have females. How do you sex a tree? And Whitney said, you look between the limbs. <laughs> that, was, that was his answer. One of the things that I do remember was the lady that called in one time and said uh, uh, that her cow had eaten all of the foliage off of her favorite bush and she wondered what to do next, and my dad said, turn the cow around. <laughs> and the reason for that was that, in, in my dad's view, the foundation for all of horticulture was manure. And so, so people would not just stop by to answer questions, they would drop off manure. And if they didn't drop it off, my dad had a little trailer on his car and he'd go get it. One of the strengths of Backyard Farmer has always been familiar faces. In the early days, the panel quickly understood that they had become trusted sources of very sound information and entertainment. As time went along, new job opportunities for some, as well as retirement for others, meant that the program had to evolve around new faculty while retaining its cornerstone answering lawn and garden questions. And so I came here in April of 1964, and I think probably the first time I was on TV uh, was when the, the 1964 show first opened <laughs> in May or June, and I was there for, I don't know, 30-some years. I retired in 1999. I don't remember very much about those real early times at 1011, cha you know, channel 1011, but <clears throat> at the time, why Wayne Whitney and Bob Rozelle and uh, John Furr and myself were the panelists. And once we got over into uh, ETV, why that was home. So I really remember the first show I ever did was down in the basement of the old temple building with all the old panelists. Wayne Whitney, John Wying, John Furr, of course, uh, George Round, and uh, uh, substituting for Bob Rozelle, my old mentor, who's one of the most wonderful people I ever met in my life. What a great guy. Well, being on TV for the first time was a fright for me. I just, it scared me to death to be there. But uh, 
I just kind of somehow pulled myself together and relaxed a little bit. That was the key. And once I relaxed, it was okay. So I came to Nebraska in 1966 uh, from Michigan State. And uh, while I was there, one of the first things that was said was, hey, you're going to be on this great program called Backyard Farmer. Uh, you've heard about it before, haven't you? <laughs> and uh, maybe there's a question in my mind whether I really had, but I said, sure, I'd love to be on that program. But it was uh, uh, a bit nerve-wracking because I was replacing uh, Wayne Whitney, who was, you know, the program. <laughs> and uh, he had quite a reputation, and uh, he had just retired. And I know there was a, a lot of concern uh, about having a new person on the panel. There wasn't, you know, many changes in those days, and I was about the first one in many, many years that was new on the program. So uh, it did make me nervous to see, you know, how could I fit in, and I knew there was concerns on all the panel's <laughs> parts to whether I would fit in or not, but uh, stuck with it. <laughs> in 1976, uh, Dave, I think, asked me if I'd like to substitute for him occasionally on Backyard Farmer. And so I agreed to, and uh, sometimes maybe once a month I'd be on. And uh, uh, of course I was nervous the first few times, but you know, when you had uh, the experts like John and Bob and, and Don on there, um, if I got myself in trouble, they could cover for me pretty quickly. <laughs> Coming on to a live, uh, yard and garden show was just a little bit intimidating, uh, particularly the first few shows because I didn't feel like I had the, the, the depth of knowledge I needed. So I did lots of homework, lots of studying. But here was a good part. The panel really uh, mentored me through those. Uh, John Furr and Dave Weissong, John Watkins, uh, Steiniger, I mean Steiniger helped me through so much of that. You know, and they would help me with the questions, they would be quick to jump in if I didn't know the answers. You know, it, sometimes I would struggle a little bit, you know, and they'd pop in. You know, because again, all of these individuals just had this incredible wealth of knowledge. And they had sat on the panel for already 30 some years, uh, and you know, they, they knew what the right answer probably was. You know, I'm going to go ahead and use it. You know, all part of nature's wondrous pageantry. Doesn't hurt the tree. A little bit unsightly later on. But this is just a, a great example. Uh, ash flower gall. If I was going to use the phrase, this truly is all part of nature's wondrous pageantry. Jeez, Looks like a little more good mold, digger. Yeah, more uh, colored even. Yep, they're, they're really cool and sour. Oh, Certainly oh, in my garden, it is my most serious pest of squash. Wow, and those... I they're all over me. They're all over. All uh, part of nature. No, I don't think No, so. that is not a part of the wondrous pageantry. That's just a nuisance. <laughs> just a nuisance. <laughs> um, that first year, uh, Bob Stogard, who was really more crops weed specialist rather than a turf and landscape, so he was a little bit uncomfortable on camera sometimes and and so he said oh great you're here you know we can I can have you sub for me when I can't make it to the show and you know it seemed almost natural for me to be in front of a be a ham be in front of the audience and so it, it never really made me nervous we took off and uh, the first time I did this show I gotta admit I was nervous but I'm still nervous today and it's been 21 years so if you're not nervous then you're not paying attention gee I'd like to be somebody like that someday, you know, giving out information to help people with their gardening. And uh, it is interesting because I had no idea that by becoming an entomologist, you know, going through college in entomology, that one day I would be asked to be part of the program. And uh, wow, so it's sort of like, yeah, I'd like to be that kind of a guy. And then I found myself on the other side of the camera being that kind of a guy. Well, I was on Backyard Farmer the first time in 1998, mm -hmm. so I've uh, been on the show for 14 years. I wanted to do it, and uh, I guess that I wanted to overcome that fear of of TV and, and live interviews. And yeah, I was really nervous. And uh, you know, making sure you study a lot before you go on TV, and make sure you know if you if you have any indication of what the questions are going to be. Uh, those answers, getting those down real well, and, and getting help from the panel. A lot of the senior members on the panel were great help. 
for the for a young person starting out in the field. I was in the first class of uh, Master Gardeners, and lo and behold, they put me on that panel, sight and unseen, the first year I was on the class. Oh my goodness! And I've been there ever since. Have Have you been doing Plant of the Week for 33 years? I started about nine years ago for Don Steiniger. He was talking about the bug man always had bugs to bring in and so forth. And I said, well, I've got 300 plants in the backyard. If you want, I'll try and bring a different one a week. So I had never even heard of Backyard Farmer other than just peripherally. I hadn't, I hadn't seen it. I knew Don Steiniger was on the show and he was the Backyard Farmer. I was actually educated as a landscape architect, so to sit in the horticulture chair was really both fun and a little bit frightening for me. I went from there into doing a, a trial hosting once, and from there finally into being the host of the show, and I think it's been about eight years, give or take, one way or the other, that I've actually been the host of the show. For most of its history, Backyard Farmer has been a live program. And not being able to step back and edit out some of the stuff sometimes can result in some awkward moments on television. Actually, that makes it really good TV. It shows that we're all just human, and those moments make for some really amazing television, and it just shows you how much fun a live gardening program can really be. Our insect expert is University Extension entomologist Fred Baxendale. Next to Fred is Extension turf grass specialist, Rock Aswa. Hello, Rock. Haven't seen you for a little while. I was here last week. You were? Yes. <laughs> That's a little while. I hate snakes. <laughs> I hate snakes. And I just, that is the one thing. If, if everyone wrote in and said, we don't want snakes on the show anymore, that'd be just fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis has a lot of fun with those, and we have a lot of fun Little with those. Little teeth can't do much harm whatsoever. So it's just kind of like gumming me now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is the razor. <laughs> They're all done, gumming? Okay, see, nothing to worry about. Great sample, Dennis. Yes. I'm not, I'm not sure bleeding, Lauren would Dennis. agree with that. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> nothing yeah. to worry about. Lauren, nothing you want to get worry. back in no, your chair I'm, and answer yeah. your question? <laughs> I'm going to wait till he gets that thing put away first. It's put away. <laughs> I'd love to be here on snake night. They planned this. Just so and I'm... we'll have um, all the venomous snakes as well. So you get to see all our different species of rattlesnakes as well as the many non-venomous snakes, including this beautiful milk snake that's found across the state of Nebraska. You look in the inside. If the seeds are white, <laughs> it's hot. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I don't think your guys gonna... I wasn't in on this. <laughs> that one is hot. <laughs> That I didn't even taste, I just got close, you know, like, like that. <laughs> that one is hot. I remember one time I got a little glass vial of kind of a brownish powder. And uh, I looked at it and I said, oh, that sure looks like uh, a rust, maybe rose rust or cedar apple rust, a bona fide plant disease. And, and the spores, uh, fungus seeds, are just about this color, and you know, if you, if you collect a lot of them, why well, you'd fill this little vial. Okay, one of my good entomology friends the next day saw me, and he laughed and laughed. He said he had squ he, that I was right; it was rust, but he had scraped some oxidized metal into this little vial, and it was iron rust. <laughs> Probably some of the favorite memories of the show are things that fortunately our viewing audience cannot see. It's Dave Wagenslag started this and we'd start rating the other panelists question off screen. So we had little cards and we would put, you know, eight, you know, it was out of 10. It was kind of like scoring and, you know, it got to be sort of competitive and sometimes, you know, you'd get a three and then, then we'd go off camera, or we'd go to a break, and then there'd be a lively discussion about how could you rate that a three, and it was, it, that was really a lot of fun, and, and it was what was going on off camera as we went through the day, or the, the you know, the, the taping of it. It was, it was really, really quite fun, and I'm not sure the viewers ever knew when they'd come back to us and we'd be smiling ear to ear that we were actually laughing prior to that and coming on camera, and I'm sure there were a few times we got caught in the act, you know. I reached up, and I pulled a yellow jacket off my face. Of course, it immediately stung me in the thumb, 
And so about the time I'm getting this question on gladiola strips, uh, I'm getting stung by a yellow jacket. And again, so I'm, I'm trying to pretend nothing is happening, you know, with, my, with the tears starting to well up in my eyes from the pain of this yellow jacket. Fred uh, was demonstrating, um, I think it was a real colorful moth. It was still alive. And I think Fred had borrowed it from somebody and he's showing it and doing, you know, all of a sudden, I guess that moth got tired of being on TV and it took off. <laughs> Isn't that interesting, Lauren, how when they're describing diseases, they say cat vomit, poop, <laughs> and measles. And, and it's, it's your passion. Well, I think they're being trained that way for some of the things. I, our producer introduced the video as, as nasty fungi in the landscape. So I, I, I'm going to start something different here. Are you Movement feeling a little, a little picked on? Yeah, I'm feeling picked on. And then we brought snakes. Getting a little personal, isn't it? <laughs> you know, if there's a blank seat here next week, you know what happened. And when you pick them up, they get so scared, they squirt out that pretty much pure water into your hand. You can't get warts from toads, you get warts from the people sitting next to you with a virus. <laughs> now, this is a full-grown toad. Amy, well, don't. What are you blaming me for, man? I think that the most interesting moments that I personally had on Backyard Farmer was when Fred Baxendale brought in his insects. And I had no problem with the creepy crawler type, the, the caterpillars and all of the larvae and things like that. It's the flying insects that really got to me. But you know, from here, it's just this iridescent green sheen. And yeah. as you've noticed, very smelly. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I got Sorry. it. Sorry, audio engineer. It <laughs> buzzed. Just, you know, I've been holding my breath through that whole demonstration, Fred, but man, that was close. Got away on that. <sighs> anyway, okay, we got a minute. Sense. Good. Needs Can we talk about hostas now? <laughs> it's one of the factors, at least anything that, you know, is detrimental to the growth, but generally it would be water. And now we know that we have an artist in our midst. Well, Fred, Fred has a whole bunch of weevils that have a long snout, and this is just about, you know, an enlarged head of a weevil. Wanda the Wonder Weevil. The leaves are, of course, wilted. There's no indication when I cut into the branch tissue that there's any discoloration. And uh, from the sample, we just can't tell a thing about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's from our producer, and so he should know better, right? That's from our... The other thing that is always fun and challenging is hurting those cats on air when they get on a roll and they decide they really don't want to make eye contact with me it's kind of hard to get them to understand that we're out of time and I, I don't have the ability and my legs aren't long enough to be able to kick anybody under the table Sixty years is a long time to do anything, and our program has had a few changes over the years, but one thing has remained the same. We make this program because we love gardening, and we want our audience to succeed and have fun too. Now, here are a few of the other reasons why we've made it so far, and why we hope to keep going for another sixty years. I believe it has the distinction of being the longest running uh, educational program in all of public television in the country. There was a point in the 1960s when Backyard Farmer had the highest rating of any educational television program in the United States. I have seen programs that were done that totally turned out to be academic and they didn't last very long. And I think that you have to have fun on the program. Again, our connection with Nebraska. That they know that we're real people, we're not actors. You know, they see that on the show. You know, we're not actors. You know, particularly me. You know, I stumble over words. I do, you know, lots of things like that. But, you know, that makes me real. That makes the show real. I think that's what people liked is that, you know, these were real people and uh, <laughs> not totally professional on the, on the air, but uh, uh, and still getting information across. So, you know, just because of how the show was done, you really became part of people's lives. I think the reason we see Backyard Farmer is such a popular show is that, that our viewers, they just really, they like the, I think, the science-based information that we deliver. Uh, we're not trying to sell anything. 
and, and I think that's key in today's world that everybody's got a product to sell and, and on Backyard Farmer that's not it. The, the charisma that we share with the viewers that uh, they welcome us into their living room uh, you know every week and we become friends we become part of the family. People are again returning to the kind of gardening and appreciation for their landscape and their environment that was obvious during the Victory Garden years or during Depression times, those kinds of things. We're becoming greener, more sustainable. We're understanding the impacts, either positive or negative, that we can have on living things and living systems. I can't tell you how much I learned about my own backyard listening to all of the comments and the suggestions from the panelists. Uh, you know, don't water too much, don't fertilize too much, don't overdo it, let Mother Nature take her course. Uh, it's helped me so much while I was doing Backyard Farmer and today because I'm still an avid gardener. And I think that's one of the staying powers behind it is it's really good information. It's really helping people in their own yards. And, you know, they're, they're like, they're thinking you're this, you know, mega star. And I love that because it's, you know, it's good for the ego, obviously. You know, it's nice to get your ego stroked. But it also gives the, the, the dedication of these fans to this, to this effort that's been going on, you know, for 60 years. It's just amazing to me. And, it, and they pass it on from generation to generation. I think the biggest insight to why the show has lasted so long is that there's been an interaction albeit through email or direct questions or phone questions, but the audience has been able to drive the show at least to a certain extent. So Backyard Farmer answers questions, it provides a service to the people of the state, and it's just plain fun. People enjoy watching the panel and silly things that happen sometimes, and, and you never know what's gonna come out of some of these guys. <laughs> enjoyed our look back at the last 60 years of Backyard Farmer. It was so much fun to hear those old stories, see those old faces, and listen to the kinds of things we used to talk about on air. The show is growing, of course, into the next century and the next decades. Technology has helped us become far more than just a television show, and who knows where that's going to take us in the future. One thing remains certain, and that is that Backyard Farmer will always answer your gardening questions. So join us for the next 60 years on Backyard Farmer. Good night, good gardening. We'll see you all next time right here on Backyard Farmer.